Hi Boss here and today I have Sony's Z1R high-end headphones. Now I met Nao Tsunoda of Sony back in 2011 at one of the Fuji Avec headphone festivals and then and every six months at the festival since then I've asked him the same question, when are you going to produce an R10 replacement? Now the MDR R10s were produced in 1989 and, and were sold for about 10 years and were you know at the time you know an ultra high-end headphone where you know and even afterwards, there was still uh, a very legendary headphone with people paying up to six to seven thousand dollars for a pair, and they have. It's been you know everyone's been looking out for Sony to produce a successor, and since Sony was in the red for a very long time, uh, they it's been you know hard to kind of for them to I guess justify producing high end gear until recently until they proved them that they could produce good you know uh, successful consumer goods. So now they've worked their way up to it. Prior to that, of course, were the the good old Z7s and. And looking at these, just look at the, the, the size comparison. These look, the, the Z7s look kind of puny against the, uh, the, uh, the Z1Rs. They're, they're quite a bit smaller, uh, quite a bit smaller headphones. You know, the, the, the big cups of the Z1Rs, you know, make, <laughs> these feel inadequate now. So they're, but the R10s, when they were new, were $2,600 with a you know, fancy leather case and all that. And... $2,600 back in 1989 is probably about four, over $4,000 now. So these at around the $2,000 mark are actually kind of relatively a bargain, all things considering. And they're light headphones. They're not heavy at all. Uh, you know, you have, we've been used to getting planar magnetic headphones, which are quite heavy and uh, quite expensive. But these are, if anything, quite reasonable. And I've seen the odd person online who seemed to have got the odd bargain way below retail. So... All things considered, for a top-end headphone, they Sony look like being the, the, the bargain option there. So as headphones go, they're, you know, they're fairly conventional. If you looked at the, you know, the Z7, you're, you're looking at much the same kind of thing. They're very comfortable. They've got these nice, big, plushy you know, ear pads that you have here. And you've got big drivers. Now, the, the big driver thing, if I just pop off a cup, not a cup, an ear pad, you have these big 70 millimeter drivers. Now, Sony's been going down the road of big drivers for quite a while now. There's the MA900s, which were very kind of obscure headphones, but uh, they started off a trend with, with you know, fairly inexpensive models that uh, this big driver is what the, the design they've settled on. And it came with much, my first, much like my first impressions that they, to me, they were, uh, you know, like listening to, you know, a dynamic driver pretending to be a planar magnetic. They have, you know, they have a, a big authoritative and very detailed base, which is one of the, the main things that you got about uh, uh, with plate magnetic headphones. Now, they also use the same cable system as the Z7, so you have 3.5 millimeter connections. The good thing in these being external is you can use any 3.5 millimeter plug. This one, I have the Kimber cable on on the pair I'm using here. It, they screw in so that they'll attach. They can they'll attach quite comfortably without being screwed in. But screwing them in, you know, makes them stay on even even more securely than uh, than usual. So, but you could make up any old headphone cable uh, using just an ordinary 3.5 millimeter plug. So in that regard, is the other other thing is just whatever termination you choose to use. And of course, Sony has, you know, 6.3 millimeter, uh, 3.5 millimeter terminations, and now their new Pentacon termination, which is. Uh, well, I hope we'll replace everything in terms of headphone connections because it just solves all the problems of balance, single ended what have you, portable, everything. It can, it's, it's universal. And if you buy one of the new Walkmans, you can buy, you know, Kimber or the ordinary cables with the, the Pentacon connector. So they also use, um, they also, of course, have this, this nice dome with a dome shape and the, the special paper they use inside their closed back headphone, of course, to give you know the ideal acoustic chamber and something we saw with the uh, good old Z7s is that the, the acoustic chamber is just plastic and had nothing lining it which to me caused a little bit of distortion so I did you know as I if you see my video I did a bit of a tape mod inside covering it with surgical tape and now these sound like a baby version of these you know with not as much detail or, or spaciousness but still much the same kind of sound signature. Now, in Sound Signature, that's where, you know, they take a diversion. If you see my Utopia review, my Utopia, uh, the Utopias, for example, in comparison, are fairly neutral. That is, they're, they're not, they don't have a particular emphasis on any particular range, like the bass, mids, or treble, though they're a little bit, probably high, a little bit uh, brighter in the treble than maybe is purely neutral. Um, these, on the other hand, the tuning is uh, are apparently designed to mimic a pair of Duntex Studio speakers, 
and a very much kind of old school, warm, hi-fi system kind of tuning. Now with the, the Kimber cable, which probably makes them sound a little bit warmer than uh, is maybe most ideal, the, the first thing one no, you notice, at least on my system and on, on Sony's desktop amp, which I, I tried in store with, at uh, the local Sony store, is you know, the, the, the very detailed and, and, and forward bass of these. So they're more an entertaining and, and kind of enjoyment tuning than a, a neutral one. Also, the treble's a little bit down from maybe what I would call ideal. They're not as especially noticeable against things like HD800s and uh, Focal Utopias. They're not as, not as bright. And, but what's interesting is the mid-range isn't recessed. The mid-range is a little bit forward too. And it's not like a, so that you don't get a V shape. You've got something more like an M shape. So an uh, interesting question that was brought up uh, on my head fire thread about my shootout between these headphones was, now, how does our, our ALO, our Campfire Audio's Vegas sound in comparison to these? Well, the Vegas are, of course, IEMs, but they have this kind of V-shaped thundering bass. And so I did a listening comparison, and when I switched back to the Sonys, they didn't sound so bass strong as, you know, the Vegas did. So they're not very, very bass strong, but they are quite bass strong. And the interesting thing was that even listening to, say, old Coltrane or, or, or Miles Davis or what have you, it was bringing out some, some bass notes in there, which I hadn't actually noticed before. So... Overall, though, the, the tuning reminds me of the secondhand stores we have here that have those old JBL speakers that have these horn tweeters and, you know, the Macintosh systems that paired with them and listening to jazz on those where it's kind of dark but kind of relaxing and enjoying. They have a very, very much um, a signature that is more for, the, more for a listening pleasure to me than for, you know, pure accuracy. But in that regard, even the, one of the thing, characteristic factors of these is, you know, with the angled drivers and, and the, the large ear space, is you do get a very great sense of space uh, around the music, but not one like the HD800s, which tend to make everything sound spacious and lack intimacy. These, when the music needs to be intimate, when you need to rock out, for example, when you need to be up close, these with a the slightly forward mid-range do seem to allow you to do that really, really well. However, when the music needs to be spacious and wide and open, they do that as well. So I find them very true to the, the, you know, the size of the recording you're listening to. If it's supposed to be open, it's supposed to be open. If you want to be intimate, it can be intimate. The problem is maybe that it can, I do feel it's kind of a little bit too harsh, a little bit harsh in the mid-range, kind of mid-range and treble a little tiny bit grating, so they're not as kind of smooth and pure as some of the headphones I have here, like some of the planers, and especially Focal's Utopias. They're a little bit uh, on the, tiny bit on the aggressive side, but that can be very enjoyable as much as anything. Now, negatives to them, of course, the warm tuning is something that, if you listen to it on its own, can be very relaxing and pleasing, but kind of in comparison can be a little bit too dark and a little bit, uh, a, little, a tiny bit muffled, especially initially if you're used to other headphones. But with longer term listening, again, that enjoyment seems to has grown a lot on me. And you can switch things around, you can try different cables, will we'll have a side effect. Amplification, less so. I kind of mix them through, you know, the good old Pico Power, the NFB11, the Studio 6. What I amped them with, I mean, you could hear the characteristics of the amp, but it wasn't quite so important. It wasn't like the Utopias, which were extremely reflective of the amp and really needed the high-end stuff. These will power fine out of a portable, and I even plug them into Fios X7, plug them into a Mojo, plug them into a variety of portables, and it, there wasn't a, a gigantic amount of difference. They seem to be fairly flexible in, 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 in that regard. Actually, I'd probably say that the, you know, fine-tuning with the cable may be more significant in some respects, as, as an irritating as some people may find that ideal. But the, the lovely thing is being light and comfortable with, you know, it even has numbers for the adjustment on the side. They just, you know, I just put them on and 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 relax and and listen and enjoy myself. And and so while initially I was sort of playing around with EQ and thinking, yeah, I don't know, uh, you know, after just forgetting all about that and relaxing, I've come to re these have really grown on me as headphones. They're just uh, ones I want to pick up and listen with and and and, and relax and enjoy. So. Yeah, two minds about the, the uh, Z1Rs. I think they're going to be love it or hate it cans. If you want kind of a hi-fi kind of, exp you know, kind of, uh, you know, home system kind of experience in your head, these do fantastically and they do have many uh, good aspects, especially the level of detail retrieval is very high, even though with a kind of darker tuning, it's not always so noticeable. Through the bass and mid-range, you know, the, the detail that came out was fantastic, especially. But, uh, you know, if you do want a kind of neutral dead tuning and they're not going to give you Focal's Utopias for half the price, for example, 
they're going, I think they're more interesting to listen with than Sennheiser's HD 800s. They're, they're more, uh, more in tune with the music and they're not just one presentation which the HD 800s have. They're not quite as balanced as, say, Mr. Speaker's Ethers, which tend to be probably their only imbalance is the sort of the, the mid bass is a little bit strong. I mean, these just have strong bass and they're not shy of it. Not excessively strong, but quite strong. I think they're not shy of their own character, whereas everything else is trying to hit, you know, some kind of perfect ideal. These are trying to entertain you. They're very much an entertaining pair of cans. So, yeah, that's a kind of tough one on these. You know, I, they, I like them more than that. I've spent more time with them and that the utopias aren't here to, to seduce me with their ridiculous levels of detail. So, I mean, I could very much live with a pair of these. They work with most genres of music much better, uh, especially stuff, you know, if stuff is a bit bass light, you know, like sort of older recordings, that's fine. Stuff that needs to be entertaining, modern recordings with a big bass kick, these are fantastic, they'll give you that. They are, in many ways, a more relaxing or rounder than other headphones I have here, except maybe the Myth to Speakers Ethers, which tend to hit the spot, and now are heading a little bit towards the darker side of things with the latest tunings. So in the end, yes, I'm going to say a big yes for these. What these really knocked off the peg was the $2,000 Ultrasound Edition 8EX, which I just heard recently, which just don't have that detail retrieval that you should get for $2,000 in a closed pair of cans. While they're too large, they're not portable, you're not going to take them out in the, you know, the, the bus or train with you ideally. They are, I reckon, a fantastic effort from Sony. And, well, whether they'll be a true successor because to the R10s, well, that's going to be probably hotly debated. But in a true example of... of Sony's technological and engineering ability and ability to produce a fantastic product, these are definitely a good example. So I don't know if I can really adequately describe these versus, you know, other headphones, but I hope you liked what I attempted to do all the same. And if you did, give it a thumbs up. Also, subscribe if you'd like to see more videos, and I'll see you online.